So I think one of the key things with artificial intelligence is it's here and we have to embrace it because it's not going away. And the trouble is, if we don't embrace it as veterinary professionals, there's nothing to stop AI developers distributing direct to pet owners, which effectively cuts the veterinary professionals out of the loop. I think it's vital, particularly at this age and stage where AI is really starting to expand across the board, but also in the pet and healthcare, animal healthcare space, that as vets, we're involved in all stages of AI product lifecycle, from the ideation to the training data, where that comes from, to making sure the AI models are using that data appropriately, to then rolling out the product and what that looks like and the messaging around that, through to following up and making sure the product is doing what it says it's going to do and actually benefiting animal welfare and making sure that that feedback loop continues throughout the life cycle of that AI product. So AI is here and it's so important that vets at all levels of the profession really understand how they can get involved to ensure as the custodians of animal health and welfare that we're making sure this has a benefit for our patients. Now, I know that presents a lot of challenge at the moment because we don't necessarily know where and how to get involved. And I think one of the things the industry is looking at at the moment increasingly in the discussions that I'm hearing and having is how do we join the dots between veterinary professionals and AI, AI developers, AI users. So if somebody comes into the practice with an AI that they are using to inform their pet's health and track their symptoms, for example, how do we know if we can trust that? How do we take that and use it in our health advice and care management plans. And I think at the moment, there isn't a lot of guidance around this. I think, again, that's a huge opportunity for veterinary organisations to start providing some frameworks and guidance that, that vets in practice can work from. I know that when I was in clinical practice, it gave me fear when people walked in with the early wearables, you know, the first iterations of wearables. I was thinking, well, how do I how do I use this data? Is it giving me accurate information about this dog's movement? And, and should I use that to inform, for example, arthritis treatment plans? And until we know how robust and reliable the technology is, until there are those frameworks in place against which we can analyze the accuracy of the data that the AI is giving us, then there's a lot of more questions to be asked. And those questions at the moment can only really be answered by our own research. So listen to podcasts on AI, get involved in the discussion, start to learn what good AI looks like. There are some really basic principles out there. In fact, I actually penned a white paper on AI in the veterinary profession, which is available freely through the VetCT website. And in that, it talks about some of the principles we can look at. For example, understanding the data things have been trained on, understanding whether or not there's been a vet in the whole life cycle of that product, and a lot of that is around the transparency of the AI providers, the product providers, to provide that information in a way that's really easy and accessible and understandable for the veterinarian in practice, for example. So by starting to understand some of these principles, how we can look for that information, how we can apply it in our clinics, then we can start to be empowered to understand how we can best apply AI to support patient care. And I think one of the keys with technology adoption in a people-centered industry is actually to understand how people behind technology, people empowered through technology, is a really positive thing at all stages of a patient care pathway. So for those people who are technophobes, and I certainly used to be one of them, some of the low-hanging fruit to really start adopting technology in a way that feels really wholesome and really positive is to actually use some of the existing technology people-powered technology that already exists. So for example, at VetCT, we have teleradiology, we have specialist consultancy, which is all delivered through technology, but it's people behind that technology. So it's people through technology rather than technology, rather than people. And I think once we start to adopt these technologies and understand how they can improve practice efficiencies, how they can improve patient care, how they can improve team well-being, how they can improve client experience, and then we layer AI onto that, but there's always that human in the loop, then actually technology of any shape or form, whether it has artificial or human intelligence in different ratios, actually becomes a really empowering tool and builds trust in that technology and enables us to use it to best inform good patient care.